guys. Uh, thank you guys for having me um, as I switch my hat. <laughs> um, I just wanted to have this roundtable discussion to put on the forefront what things work for us as planners of a student-led conference like ECO. And um, we had a lot of challenges. We had a lot of uh, victories. Um, there were some uh, logistical hip hiccups and things like that. But I think that overall, we had a very positive response and a very uh, significant turnout. And um, I just wanted to uh, touch bases with you guys to discuss some of the things that worked for us. So um, just kind of an overview, when we were getting into the planning of ECO, we, um, we used similar tools like what we're using right now. We, we used Google Meets, um, Zoom to, to have conversations about what, what is it that we need. And we pulled in our, our professors to have those conversations with us, who, people who have done this before. So um, I'm curious to know uh, in the room, are there any students who plan to present in the next coming year uh, maybe I can answer some questions in particular areas. Um, being that this is a roundtable discussion, I'm really open to kind of let an organic conversation come about. So um, is there anyone who would like to share about what conferences you may have in the works that you may need support around? Should we raise our hands or just speak? Uh, we can just speak, Gina. Hey, Gina. Hi. So um, as I had mentioned to you last year, I, I did present, I had two presentations in the ECO conference last year. And it was just, I mean, I would have never known that you and Mishu, that was the first time that you guys had done this kind, you know, that kind of offering. It was outstanding. I think that um, all of the presentations and the panels and all the speakers, they were just, um, they were fantastic. So kudos to you guys for um, a great um, event. And as I told you then, I would be interested in helping this year. So I'm wondering about this year, will it be virtual? How do you sign up? All of that. Mashoud? Um, uh, this year is gonna be in um, uh, Minneapolis. Uh, August, uh, Augustine Hoffman, who is the lead on this, was here earlier. Uh, if we had a presentation earlier, we are still in the, we are still in the uh, deciding if it's going to be virtual or if it's going to be in, in person as everything that is going on. Uh, he, he mentioned earlier that possibly around uh, the latest by August, we will figure out when and where is it going to be virtual, is it going to be in person. So uh, in terms of, um, I mean, I will ask you to, to um, keep looking at this crowd website. And I can always reach out to you when we make the final decision, just to give you an uh, instance head up, if that helps. Mm -hmm. That helps. And I also was wondering um, how long, how much in advance did you start planning? Oh, maybe, what, a shoot, maybe three to four months? Mm, no, it's not up to that. It, it wouldn't, it would be, if at all, it's probably two months. Uh, ours was the, the not the traditional way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I was a student representative. So my was to look for a school to take it on. But since we didn't get, uh, you know, we, no school was at that time ready to take it on. Uh, at the last minute, we took it on. And so we had, I'm very sure we had less than two months to put that, what you see together. And it was just the two of you? Or what was it, a, is it a, how many people on the team? It was um, I trying to see how how uh, labor intensive and time intensive it is, so that I will be able to adequately plan if I joined you guys. You know what? I'm not trying to throw Panisa under the bus. I I sort of I sort of started this thing in with a mental process of doing it for almost a month. But I've been checking in with her. She was, she was busy with school, and so by the time she finally joined me. Uh, so we spent like a whole month every day together up to like 11, 11 p.m. sometime at night. So for me, it was more than uh, say two months, but for myself and her and Vanessa, and then from the faculty members from time to time, but it was strictly me and her for 
a whole month without doing any other thing, just you know, bringing everything to the table, making sure uh, we reach across the table to wherever we need to reach across to. I think ideally, if we could do it again, I think we would take a lot more time to plan. That four months is really a great timeline to to handle all of the things that uh, Mashoud and I were doing. But um, Mashoud definitely took on a lot of the uh, the difficult logistics part, like the scheduling and the securing of the keynote speakers, um, all of that stuff. Um, it took a lot of planning and he was able to get it done in those two months. It was a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of late night meetings, but um, I think that it came together because everybody kind of understood what we wanted to see in the vision. So um, Mashu, could you talk more about the vision that we had, like in coming up with the whole idea of what we wanted the conference to achieve? That's kind of how, that, that was really, in my opinion, what guided us to um, our keynotes. It guided us to um, the way that we structured our, our breakouts, the way that we had our, um, our rededication to a uh, Native American land that was stolen, all of those things were uprooted out of our, our, our uh, focus. Yeah, I think it helps because I, I, I mean, I actually promoted myself to chief, uh, chief, um, uh, chief host uh, because I'm, I'm an international student. I've been living here for God knows when, but you know, I'm still an international student. So I was looking for something to cut across uh, uh, all part of the world. And so we, we, we decided to go for, I believe it's social solidarity mm -hmm. uh, across the global community that actually framed and was able to help us lead. If you see the presenter, if you see uh, almost everything we present were, were almost global in scope so that we can carry every community across the world along. And I think we did. We, we had a, um, the turnout was mixed from all over. Also, um, I want to note that in structuring, once we had our theme of um, solidarity, we had to figure out, well, what fits? What panelists would fit here? Uh, what kind of vibe do we want to create? So um, we decided to go with um, panelists that um, would would sit and we would listen to them, but we wanted to construct the conversation in an interactive way. So we decided to go with a fire chat. And uh, in the fire chat, we incorporated um, a parking lot. So um, I'll explain those two things. I'm a teacher in Chicago. So we, we wanted to bring in some interactive components. So fire chat is um, a quick round of questions. It's a quick round of questions. You time it, you have your questions pre-selected. And um, the parking lot is a tool that I've used in my classroom many times where I have a, um, a big piece of a uh, post-it paper, like the huge post-its and then tiny post-its where I'll have a topic and then people post um, different questions under the topic. So we had five themes uh, for ECO, and each of those themes were on large post-its throughout the room. And prior to our panelists coming up, we asked participants to ask us questions under those themes. So we had our, our question pool already ready to go, and it was interactive because these questions came directly from participants. And I think it worked out really, really well. I think that the panel enjoyed it. I think that the people who participated enjoyed it as well. So um, yeah, uh, any questions around how you may create the theme, like how you may uh, come up with the, the vision for conferences? Does anyone have questions around that? Nope, all right, I'm gonna keep it moving then. Um, when we decided on having ECO, we know that ECO has a certain culture. Uh, we knew that ECO would, would require us to have some, some social components of gathering in the, in the um, spirit of community psychology, we needed to have a place to share ideas. So um, we started our, our first night with 
African drumming. And um, Mashoud, would you like to talk more about how you were able to secure uh, our African drumming in the space and even the challenges that we faced in, in presenting that African drumming at the hotel? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Obari is, uh, is the African drummer's name. Uh, he's been an associate of mine for some other project. And he was happy to take it on. Uh, but I had booked an hotel, and they've agreed that uh, we will be allowed to do um, Sorry. <laughs> we'll be allowed to uh, take the drumming section. Uh, our, the idea with the drumming was, I, I believe we said uh, we wanted to drum our intellectual might. That was the title of our drumming section. But unfortunately, um, maybe like 10 minutes into the drumming, uh, the power of the hotel came down and said, you know, this is not what they signed up for. And so they disrupted the process. Uh, we, we couldn't really carry on with what we intend that night for, but regardless, the five minutes, 10 minutes that we had together was such a beautiful moment for us. Uh, I guess because Barry has been doing this for so long. Uh, he's a clinical psychologist as well. So he, his, his um, practice is to use drumming to, to um, awake some of the, you know, sleeping element as he calls it in our system, you know. I think that the first night of ECO was really, it was a lot of uh, pressure building up to that day. Um, a lot of things went into it. We had to, we wanted to create a professional environment, but also um, balance it with community, balance it with um, ideas and the space to, to be open and, and meet new people and uh, make new connections. So, um, it was it was really challenging. Uh, the hotel was not with the African drumming at all, uh, so we had to kind of shut that down and create a smaller space for ourselves to um, enjoy um, day one. But I think that we were able to really be flexible and and take on those challenges as they came because we all kind of had the same goal in mind, which was a successful conference. Um, one thing that I will say, though, um, that was huge for us was the selection of the food. So Michelle did all the hard stuff, and I did the fun stuff, which was uh, selecting our caterer for um, our Saturday. You know, ECO is a one-day conference, so Saturday, um, I had to do some research on who would be the best fit for our particular demographic of uh, participants, and how can I... Uh, create, um, how can I bring CP into that part? So I started with um, good old, um, the one where we uh, check all of the food, like what's Yelp? I think it was Yelp that I used. So I went on Yelp and we were in Lyle, Illinois for our conference. So I, I looked up family restaurants in Lyle and came across a wonderful bakery, um, Ellie's Bakery, and uh, went in and had a conversation uh, with the um with the owners a few weeks maybe a month before the conference started and uh, we were able to create a custom a custom menu that fit all of the different um types of people who may want to eat like some people are vegan some people are vegetarian we wanted to accommodate all of those different dietary needs and or restrictions so they were wonderful and able to accommodate us and um we were able to pull this thing off without a hitch. It was really exciting. Um, the food uh, was wonderful and the environment was fantastic. Uh, people, we were able to um, take many pictures on what that looked like and how everyone was just laughing and having these conversations with new people. And uh, the, the actual caterer, they were awesome. That's why I loved that we chose a, uh, a small mom and pop restaurant versus a larger caterer because he really took care and uh, concern with um, the food that he brought 
and the quality of it and making sure people had smiles on their faces when they were picking up their food, the, even the logistics of the line and making sure that the line stayed short and moving and people had spaces to sit. All of these things uh, we had to kind of figure out on the fly. So um, highly recommend checking out your space and uh, making sure that your space can accommodate your, your participants uh, beforehand. Um, we did not get that luxury. We, we found out the day of where we would be sitting for lunch and uh, what that would look like. So uh, as much as you can preview the space, I would say do that. As much as you can get a hold of um, custodial staff and any, any staff that works in a building, that's beforehand would be very helpful. Mashu was running back and forth trying to get our eco banner Remember that machine, we were trying to get that eco banner put up in front of the building and we were, didn't have the tools. So we had to find people with the tools. So the biggest lesson that I believe that I learned from eco was flexibility. Being a school teacher helped me with that as well, but definitely eco taught me how to be flexible and roll with the punches. Um, I have a question here. Someone asked in terms of budget is, is this something that we would work out with? I don't know who Jean is. Were there times when you were fronted a large sum of dollars and then wait for SCRA reimbursement? Mashoot? You on mute. There's two ways to the money part. Uh, there's that rotating uh, balance from the previous year. That was a blessing to what we did. Uh, even though you got lost in the, the bureaucracy of, you know, the school system that was that hosted in the past year. Um, then we also generate funds from, you know, uh, we, we were charging uh, for registration, I think we charged 20 $15. I mean, $15 for students, uh, 60 I believe, for professionals. So we made some money. Uh, you know, minus and uh, plus, you know, uh, from balancing the money from the previous year and the money that we made, we were able to have something, you know. So it's not, um, let me see the question again. It's not, um, yeah, so it's not, um, it's not scrap to balance us any money or reimburse in any way. It's kind of, the money kind of self-generate from, you know, what we did and what whoever is going to do it next is going to do, you know. But there's always a balance from the, like this year, if I put all the, I'm still working on the balance and uh, balancing the book. But if I put everything together, we should have something like, you know, two to three thousand that will give forward to uh, Augustine Hoffman for, for the for the program in October of this year. I'm sure he's going to generate some other fund too that's going to pass on to the, uh, the next, uh, next post. Rashid, can I comment on finance a little bit? Please. Okay. Um, the, the practice that Mashud is describing of the previous hosts um, having a balance that then gets transferred to the next year's host goes back 30 years from the time that I hosted an eco conference when I was a graduate student in DePaul. Um, more than 30 years. But what's happened in the last five years, six years, is that um, people are having a much harder time getting their universities to serve as fiscal agents for conferences. Uh, they're getting a lot of resistance from universities to do this. So what Scrawl has been doing for some of the regional the eco conferences and the regional, regional conferences is we've been acting as the fiscal agent. So the money from the previous host could come to us. Um, you make, you know, you do what, you know, spend your upfront money the way you need to spend it. Um, the registration fees come to us. Um, and so that's how we've been doing that for Southeast Eco for two years now. So that is a possibility if you're, if the hosts are not at a university that's willing to serve as a fiscal agent. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> Um, I wanted to also uh, discuss the challenges that we had with um, the breakout sessions. That was the most challenging part because 
I know that there were countless hours put into creating the schedule and creating um, each section of the breakout sessions, whether it was, um, you know, within this hour, this hour, what type of session, because we had more than one type of um, presentation. We did um, fire, we did, what did we call it? Village dialogue circles, which was similar to a round table. And we did uh, poster sessions, but we changed the format of our poster sessions so that it wasn't just, you kind of like, just standing, waiting, hoping, wishing for someone to come to your poster and give you an opportunity to share your work. We set it up so that each poster had about four minutes. So every person in the room, we would pack out a room and every person in the room uh, would listen to one presentation at a time. And each one of those presentations for posters went. And at the end, we had everyone to come together and open a panel up for discussion. And I think that it worked really, really well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the logistics because we did uh, overbook and double book a couple of rooms. It only happened like once or twice, but it's again, back to the flexibility of, of just knowing, knowing your space and knowing what's available to you and how to kind of, um, on the fly kind of fix and shift those things, not stress about it, but work together, I think was really uh, key and clutch for us. Um, and thinking about um, the other social aspects, which was my favorite part uh, of ECO, um, we had our African drumming session on Friday, but um, on Saturday, we uh, had a bonfire and that is a tradition, um, a long lasting tradition with ECO. And we had challenges with figuring out, well, how are we going to do that? And who's going to be there? And what's the vibe? And what, what do we, how do we want to create this vibe, this atmosphere? So Mashu's wonderful wife um, was able to uh, host us, well, obviously, along with Mashu. And we, we had a bonfire uh, with our host. And um, Mashu, I'm going to talk about what I did on that, on that part, but let's talk about what you did, too. You're on mute. <laughs> I didn't, sorry, I didn't. Um, I didn't do anything much. You know, I just uh, knew uh, I had to get um, people because it's uh, people together to to after all the hard work we have to kind of unwind. And so one thing that I think I did, if you're asking what I did, was the guy, the musician that came. I think his name is Sam or. And funny enough, I was almost going to call him to not come again because I was overwhelmed that, oh, people were leaving, people were going to leave, you know. Uh, but Erica, bless her heart, for she's been doing this for so long. We were going to have a dinner at a restaurant. And Erica said, you know what, we have so much food left over from the lunch. Why not just take it home? And so I guess that changed the whole thing. Uh, otherwise, people would have leave. But we had... At least at some point, we, are, we must have like 30 people in my compound, in my backyard. We had two artists playing. Uh, one of them is a, is a Uganda, uh, uh, I, um, uh, I forgot the type of music he plays, but it was, it was, it was decent. And so then- He uh, had his right? Did he play his own instrument? Yeah, he had all sort of instrument. Yeah, there's, there's, I think it's one of them that I know very well is Bongo, you know. Um, is from Uganda. And then we had Lina. Lina is, is going to be playing tonight uh, after, the, after we finish the section. She's going to be playing with her, with her dad. Uh, but one thing we spoke about here earlier, you were not here, Vanessa, is um, what is the community in community psychology? One thing that I'm regretting now is like we do not have the people in the community to participate in what we were doing. We only invited all the, you know, all the other academia, all the researchers, you know. There was no touch of outside people to give us some kind of information, some kind of uh, idea, you know. Uh, and I think if I, will, if I had the opportunity of hosting again, that's gonna be the first thing I'm gonna be looking to do. You know, because it seems it's more important than uh, ever now that we need to be hearing from the community uh, to be in, um, in form of whatever it is that we're doing. Um, so 
out of curiosity, how do you think um, students should approach that? Um, should it be through the keynote? Should it be through the breakout sessions? How do you feel like if we could do this thing again, how would you incorporate more community in what and in what spaces and what structure within ECO? I guess we were so worried because of, you know, we had limited time to plan. Maybe that's why that didn't come up. But as we have more time now, I will hope that if we were doing it in, um, uh, not, um, in uh, Minneapolis with uh, Augustine, uh, people should come with their friends, their family, you know, their, uh, possibly invite their neighbors. We just want to integrate it. Have people come and share their experience. See what we're doing as academia, you know, and then let them, let them tell us what they're doing as uh, community members. I, I think this is going to be interesting. I mean, I mean, I don't know about them coming to the present, uh, the, the conferences itself, but at the later evening that we had that, you know, it was a laid back, everybody was drinking and uh, eating. That would have been a good way to integrate the community members into it. Okay. Um, also, I, I wouldn't be able to have a discussion about eco and student-led conferences without talking about the volunteers that we had. Uh, we had some incredible volunteers that came from various schools, um, including National Lewis, um, that supported us with the collecting of the funds on uh, conference day when, when folks were coming in and registering day of. Uh, we needed people to man the, the front area where people were coming in to get their ID badges. That was a feat in itself, going to Staples and getting ID badges with our logo and um, making this really a professional event. But our volunteers were wonderful um, and they supported us with all of those small logistic things that we didn't think of and helping us to put um, things into action where we know we needed to shift. So um, I also wanted to mention that. But I think Mashoud is being a bit, uh, I wanted to say that you were being a bit modest with uh, the uh, bonfire that we had. It was phenomenal. Your, your wife's cooking is incredible. And uh, we, we, did, we were able to save um, the, the delicious food that we had from our lunch and bring it over to the bonfire. Um, so we didn't waste. Um, we, we did have a focus as well on um, using as little um waste creating as much as little waste as possible reducing that carbon footprint and um we had everything was um was biodegradable and and just like recyclable and we we were rinsing things out reusing things and serving family style so we were trying to um connect that back to our um dedication that we did with uh dr tiffany jimenez um where we were attempting to um uh, rededicate the land that we were actually having this conference on and Lyle, Illinois, um, as well as many other locations in Illinois are, were the homes of Native Americans. And so in that spirit, uh, we were able to really focus in on um, reducing our, car our carbon footprint. We brought water bottles for people to drink out of. We did not have um, like disposable coffee cups and things like that. Everything was reusable. So I think that made a, a significant, it was challenging, but I think that it was appreciated, um, not only by um, our participants, but definitely the teachers and, and people who came from out of town were, were very impressed with that, with that component. And I see a chat question. Um, the other faculty that were supporting us, definitely Dr. Tanya Hall <laughs> from uh, Chicago State. Um, Dr. Uh, Jimenez, Tiffany Jimenez was, incredible with uh, helping us to structure everything was on those late night zoom calls when I couldn't because I had to go teach in the morning. Um, Dr. Mingo, uh, Dr. Uh, Brad Olson helped us a lot. Um, we just really, um, Judah, Dr. Judah, he helped us a lot. Viola, a lot of people came together from our university family to come around us and make sure that there was no way to fail because we had the support in place. So, um, and everyone was really flexible. When we did make mistakes, it was like, no worries. You know, we're here to help you through. So 
Um, I'm open to have answer any questions from anyone um, in regards to, you know, future planning of Scrap, not Scrap, uh, Midwest Eco or any other Eco and um, supporting student led conferences in other places. So you can light up the chat box or you can just uh, unmute and um, ask your questions and I'll be glad to answer any other questions you may have about student led conferences. Also, sidebar, I did not get a chance to even kind of read the room to see who's here. I see a lot of my NLU family is here. Um, I would love to know where others are from and what uh, conferences may look like in uh, at your university. So I have Ted. I would like to get involved with eco planning. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think Tanya Hall is on the call and um, is collecting people who may be interested in, in eco and SCRI and planning of, of student-led conferences. Like Mashu said, we're still waiting to see um, where our eco conference will be. Um, I would love to pop up in Minnesota, considering the things that are happening right now. Um, so we're waiting to see, but that August um, would be August Hoffman would be our person of contact uh, for uh, the 2020 ECO conference. So we definitely want to get you connected with, with him. Um, I think uh, Gina had a question. She, she asked her hand up. So did you see the question? Because I'm about to send it. It was taking too long to type it. So then I was going to just speak it, but I've typed it now. So I'm sending it through the chat box. Okay, I have another question from Dr. Eileen. Do you believe it would be helpful to invite students who are considering a degree in community psychology to the eco? Absolutely, absolutely. Whether I saw undergrad presentations that were amazing. I saw graduate presentations that were amazing. I saw teams get together to do posters from uh, DePaul. Um, they were a part of the, I think it's a dual program, a clinical and community program at DePaul, and they worked on a, a study that they presented. If you are interested in anything community, anything organizing, even entrepreneurship, um, I would highly recommend ECO just for us to see each other's work and, and be able to contribute. And Gina, I'm looking for your question. I don't see it just yet. I can just say it. Um, I was asking to clarify the budget. Um, I, I, I heard you talking about there was a there's a um, amount that you all are given. Is it a hundred percent budget? I mean, is a hundred percent funded with the with the whatever the money they give you, or do you have to seek in kind donations or monetary sponsorships, or is it just what the university give you know the organization gives you and it's a fixed budget? So. Um... Uh, um, the university did not give us money. The, um, it was more of the money that was so. For instance, what we did last year, right? I mean, was it this year? No, last year. The money we generated, right, from from collecting fee from the attendees, right? Mm -hmm. That money goes to after we take all of the expenses that we spend. Whatever balance goes to the next host site. So they can use that to start their program. So when they to charge people for attending the conference, whatever balance they has automatically rolls over. Okay, yeah, I heard that. I, will, I just wasn't clear as if like that, that was totally it or did you, you know, because it's a lot of corporations sometimes that'll donate, which means that you'll have even more, um, you know, money left over. You can like supplement what the participants have to pay. So, okay, thank you. I, I just needed that clarified. I'll, I'll let Gina speak. I mean, yeah, Gina speak to that uh, because I wasn't aware if there's any possibility we could collect a donation from outside. I'm uh, not aware of that. Yeah, that, that would be, you know, we'd have to look into that, whether or not you can actually ask for donations. Um, your, the eco conferences are not an activity of SCRAW. Um, so 
you're so I don't know if you're bound by the same laws that we are regarding asking for donations. Um, hmm. My guess is it would be really difficult to legally ask for donations. Yeah. I know that for me personally, um, we had a budget, like Mashu said, there was a balance in uh, the account prior to us getting started. And there were some other funds that we were able to access, but we did have to come out of pocket and uh, sponsor some things, but we were reimbursed. So, um, but it was just about, do I want to wait for access to the funds um, when I have them? I'm just going to use them and then get reimbursed. And we were uh, fully reimbursed. For example, um, Mashoud spoke about the, the uh, musicians that we had at the bonfire. Um, the, the compensation uh, for that, we had to quickly just send. And then we got that back once we showed evidence that that was paid. So hold all receipts and make sure that anything that is spent, you uh, present so that you can be reimbursed if needed. But there was um, a significant amount of money available for us to use um, that we had access to. And if not, we were reimbursed for. Keep the questions coming, guys. Just one more clarification on the budget. So part of the problem is that you don't know what your budget is. Um, because you don't know how much you're going to collect in registration fees because you don't know how many people are coming. All you have is the information from the organizers the year before to go on. I think that is completely accurate. <laughs> and our biggest challenge um, was, well, we need uh, food, but how many people do we plan for? We had to kind of on the fly create a little algorithm to figure out like, well, it's going to be about we need about 200. So we just kind of ballparked a lot of things. And we did have, um, when it comes to the food at least, the part I can speak to, um, we did have food left. And in order to not waste, we did take that to our second location. So it was, that was a surprising um, save on our budget. We were able to kind of save some money there by not, um, getting the uh, restaurant after the uh, conference to host us and actually hosting with the host at his home. We saved lots of money there. And um, it was a lot of miscellaneous things that we wanted there that uh, we took on, but it is very challenging to know who, who you're planning for and how many you're planning for without the pre-registration because many, many people registered the day of. And it was exciting, but also very, very challenging to kind of adjust to those moving parts. So we have about uh, seven minutes left, probably six now. Um, any final thoughts? Uh, I would love to know where you guys are from and you know if you guys have any interest in student-led conferences. Um, Dr. Tanya Hall is here, Mashoud is here, I'm here to answer any of those uh, final questions before we, we close for today. Well, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, hi, Vanessa and Mashoud. I uh, wanted to say that you did a great job with uh, the Midwest Eco 2020. And uh, I too wanted to clarify that um, you, you pretty much have uh, a year uh, to plan for the conference if, if things go well. Essentially, what has been the tradition in the past is that at the uh, Eco Conference, uh, it's discussed and um, someone typically decides um, to take on ECO for the next year. Um, so uh, this year, uh, or the year prior to you, um, we didn't have any takers. So that was the issue um, and why you all had just about uh, three months of planning. So you really did do an exceptional job uh, with a very uh, short period of time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I have to really give all of my accolades to Mashoud because uh, he, he tricked me a bit and said, oh, let's, let's go ahead and plan this conference. We don't have many people 
participating and I'm alone. So you're going to just leave me alone. I said, no, of course not. I'm not going to leave you to do this alone, but it is a lot of work, but I do feel that if everyone does a little, no one has to do a lot. So it's the planning in the beginning, the pre-planning. I wish that I had more time to um, talk about the importance of that. Just the Zoom meetings that everyone was getting together with to, to, to write all of the pre-planning, the website, Mashoud, the website in itself, building the, the uh, I don't even remember which site we use, which um, engine we use, but that was a challenge in itself. Um, getting all of the information on there, Mashoud, just pass off to you because I was just like his wingman. I just kind of jumped in where he just, just fell a little short and uh, picked up the pieces there. But between the volunteers, our teachers, uh, we got it done, and I would love to participate again as a presenter um, <laughs> and um, just continue to keep this wonderful tradition going. Um, have something, would you say, uh, what would you say made all of the work worth it for you all to do this? That's Sorry, that's me doing. putting it in the chat, and um, we just have three minutes, too. I'm also a timekeeper, but okay. all well, this wonderful ask. work, I'll say it uh, verbally. All this wonderful okay. work, like what made all of this work and effort, which was amazing, by the way, too, um, worth it? Like, what would you say that people will make this all this work of hosting the conference worth it? I'm going to just say, um, once it's all done and we were having wine, it was fantastic to just sit back and reflect on every, the whirlwind of things that happened within the, the, the little time that we had to plan and seeing everyone together. Um, at the uh, bonfire, we had, my daughter came, um, Mashu's kids were there, they had s'mores, people were making s'mores and things, just, we, we really fostered community, and we were able to meet wonderful people in the field who were doing amazing things, so I think to see the smiles on everyone's faces, and to see everyone come together and actually enjoy this thing, and not just have it be another boring conference, I think was extremely rewarding for me. What about you, Michelle? Um, mostly, I think it was a challenge that, that, that pushed me. I like stuff to challenge me beyond, um, because I'd posted out to, since I'm representing the uh, Midwest region, I posted it out to all the universities in the Midwest region, asking for someone to take it on. And it seems like we had uh, months left and no, no one was willing to take it. And so it became a challenge that I had to sort of conquer. I, I, I think I got the excitement from I actually built a whole website for the first time from that experience, you know. And after that, I think I did, uh, I did uh, another website for someone else. That's from that experience. So, you know, uh, if the question is, the answer to the question is the challenges that I see ahead of me sort of guide me. I mean, some people run from challenges. I kind of embrace it. I mean, at least this one, you know, I swam towards it and I, I came out, we came out on top because at the end of the day, I wasn't the only one that came out on top. We all came out on top. So. And may I just quickly say, uh, one of the reasons that Mashoud uh, received this uh, assignment and took this assignment on is because he is the SCRA uh, Midwest student coordinator uh, we're looking for our student coordinators currently. So uh, if you're interested in serving as the SPRA Midwest student uh, coordinator, uh, please contact Mishu. Great. And we are at time. So thank you, everyone. Um, it was so wonderful to hear all of your amazing work. So um, thank you so much.